Hi, Paul here from Easy Composites, and today we've got something a bit different as I take you through the process of making this flax fibre canoe using resin infusion in a method that combines or blends advanced composite engineering with natural materials. From laying the flax fabric and balsa cores to infusing with bioresin, I'll be demonstrating the entire process to produce a canoe that rivals the weight and performance of a fiberglass one, but does so with a reduced environmental impact. Whilst flax might not suit every application due to its limited mechanical performance, it certainly makes for a compelling option in scenarios like this, proving that sustainable choices can produce both viable and, let's be honest, beautiful results. Whether you're a seasoned composites engineer or just curious about sustainable materials, welcome along and let's get into the workshop. The starting point for a moulding like this is the mould itself. Now, I didn't make this huge five metre long mould, instead got to thank one of our friends, Jim, for loaning this mould to us. Now, he's taken this mould from an existing canoe using the Unimold tooling system. And if you were looking for a detailed guide as how you would go about making a mould like this, then go and take a look at our video titled How to Laminate Large Composite Moulds. As in this video, we make a mould for an expedition sledge, which is incredibly similar to this. Now, if you're not going to take your mould from an existing part, then it might also be worth checking out the pattern making video in the same series. Before putting the mould into service, I first need to put down a coat of CR1 release agent. Now, I only need to apply one coat here as this mould has been used before, but if this was a new mould, then it would require six applications to ensure a good release. While the release agent dries and cures, we can now take a look at the reinforcement. Often, when you're working on a new project with new materials, establishing a suitable layup can be quite difficult. Now, the method that I use for this that doesn't waste excessive amounts of material is to conduct a small test sample on the mould itself. And that's what we've got here. We've got two different laminate stacks that have been infused as a cross-section of the hull. Not only will these give us really good information on the mechanical performance of the part, but we're also going to get data on the resin consumption and the resin infusion flow rate, both of which are going to be really useful when it comes to making that final part. Now, the first sample that I made, I just worked from gut instinct, and I went for two plies of 550 gram flax, either side of a six millimeter balsa that runs all over the flat areas. And the resulting laminate is definitely strong and stiff enough, in fact, it's overbuilt, and along with being overbuilt, it's overweight. So I've repeated the same test, but attempted to remove some of that weight. To do that, I've dropped from a 550 gram fiber to a 360 gram. And I've also reduced the amount of balsa wood in the core areas. And what that's given me is a very, very lightweight laminate, and in most areas, it's going to perform perfectly well. But I do have a little bit too much flex just in the bottom of the hole here. And so what I'm going to do for the final layup is take the larger core from this sample and put it into this lighter laminate. And in making this hybrid, I'm very confident that we're going to get the right balance of performance and weight for this project. So this is the laminate stack. We've got two plies of 360 gram fiber, either side of our balsa, and then then on the surface, we have a 100 gram unidirectional. Now this is really just a cosmetic layer. And I've chosen this because I really like the long grain sort of plywood appearance that you get from it. But equally, you could use a woven flax on the surface like we did when we infused this chair from a previous project. So we've now established the reinforcements that we're going to be using. Let's go and cut our kit of material. As this canoe has two planes of symmetry, I'm able to make simple paper templates for one quarter of the hull and then flip and mirror these to create the full shapes. Each ply is made up of only three pieces of material, a base and two sides. Flax does cut really easily with conventional shears, but you do need to be particularly careful when handling the unidirectional, as without a cross stitch, it is very easy to separate and damage. With all nine pieces cut, we can now look at the balsa core. 
Before we get into the specifics of balsa, let's first consider why are we using a core material at all? Well, put simply, a core material is a great way of adding stiffness without adding excessive weight. If you flex a solid laminate, it's actually the outer plies that are bearing nearly all of the load. And so if we replace those less strained inner plies with a lower density material like foam, honeycomb, or in this case, balsa, we're going to maintain nearly all of the stiffness while reducing the overall weight. In fact, this laminate sample that I've got here is lower density than water. And so this is going to give us some positive buoyancy, which is certainly no bad thing in a canoe. This is actually the first time we've featured balsa in one of our videos, but it does have some unique benefits and properties that make it an exceptional core material, not only for use with natural fibers like flax, but any other technical textile. The first thing to note is that this is in end grain configuration. So the grain of the wood is running vertically from the top surface to the bottom surface. It's manufactured in this way to maximize the compressive strength. And that's how a core is loaded in a sandwich structure. The other thing you'll see is that it's made up of blocks supported on a scrim. Not only does this allow it to follow tight curvatures, but it also provides a path for the resin to flow through during an infusion. Just because this is a natural and sustainable material doesn't mean that it's compromised on performance. In fact, ingrain balsa has one of the highest strength to weight ratios available in a composite core material. It also has the advantage that it cuts and shapes really easily, which we'll get onto now. Any conventional cutting methods will work with balsa. For this project, I'm simply going to cut around the templates using a knife. Whenever you're working with solid core materials like foam or balsa, it's really important to finish the edge of the core properly. If you were to just leave a straight 90 degree cut like we have here, this can lead to problems with bridging, so that when subsequent layers of reinforcement and your vacuum bag go onto this, they will struggle to follow the contours fully and you'll be left with a slight cavity around the edge of your core. Now that cavity is going to fill with resin, which can cause print through on the surface. And also in the case of resin infusion, it's going to create a pathway that the resin will flow down very quickly and that can disrupt your resin flow and potentially cause dry spots. Now to alleviate this problem is really straightforward. All you need to do is put a chamfer onto the edge of your core and that allows the subsequent layers to follow perfectly. Putting a chamfer on is really straightforward just using a simple sanding block. We now have our full kit of materials for the canoe, so we can get on with the layup itself. But before I start dropping the fibre into the mould, the first thing I like to do is put the sealant tape around the outside. The reason why I like to apply the sealant tape right at the beginning is because at this point, I know that the mould is completely clean and clear of any stray fibres. And so I won't be sticking the tape over it, which would of course compromise the vacuum seal. To ensure accurate placement of the material, I'm going to lightly tack the flax to the surface using Fusion Fix. Normally, I wouldn't suggest doing this directly onto the mold surface, but as I will be applying a finishing coat to the part, any slight residue left on the surface won't cause a problem. Equally, it's perfectly acceptable to use spray adhesive for the first ply if you have gel coated the mold, as again, the surface will be unaffected. To get a really neat cut line in the flax, I'm marking it off with masking tape before trimming it to the final fit. The other two panels of unidirectional are then positioned with a slight overlap. Although you should make every effort to do this as neatly as possible, any slight laps, gaps or creases will be far less visible once infused, and so it is fairly forgiving. The 360 gram twill can then be positioned. This is much easier to handle than the unidirectional and will drape easily without fraying. It is perfectly acceptable to put in small relief cuts like this in the tight corners. And then the side panels are then again positioned with an overlap and fixed with a light application of Fusion Fix. The balsa is then positioned. Note that it's no problem to have multiple sections of balsa making up a single panel. As long as they're closely butted up, the joins will have no bearing on the overall structure, as in fact, the sheets of balsa are made from several pieces butted up in this way. 
Whilst I continue to position the flax in the background, a quick reminder that Easy Composites is not just a YouTube channel and is in fact a leading supplier of materials and equipment to the advanced composites industry. To find out more or purchase any of the products featured in this video, please visit the Easy Composites website, where you'll find products like the flax reinforcement and bioresin, as well as a huge selection of other types of reinforcement, core materials, infusion consumables, and so much more. And we don't only supply big industry, we're also happy to take small orders and can ship to most countries worldwide. Now that we have all of the reinforcement into the mold, we can get on with the vacuum bagging stack. The first layer in this is going to be a peel ply. Now, this isn't strictly necessary with flax. You can actually run an infusion directly against a bag, but I'm using it as I really like the nice, consistent, non-slip finish that it provides. I'm going to position this in much the same way as it did the main reinforcement. Peel plies are tightly woven polyester or nylon fabrics that don't bond well to resin. So these can be torn away once the resin is cured, leaving a consistent texture that is often used to provide a good mechanical key for bonding to. With our peel ply in position, we can now look at setting up our resin feed and vacuum lines. The resin feed line comprises of an inlet tube, which goes to the bucket of resin. Then that passes through an infusion connector, which in turn saddles over some infusion spiral. So the resin is drawn down through this line, through the connector, down through the spiral, and then out through the gaps that are cut into that into your laminate. So wherever this spiral is positioned is where your resin will begin its journey. At the other side of the infusion, we've got our vacuum line. For that, I'm going to be using the MVL hose, which is a microporous product, which allows air to pass through it, but critically not resin. Now, there are plenty of ways of setting up an infusion without this, but as it maintains a vacuum to any dry spots that it's in contact with, I think it's a really worthwhile insurance policy. So these are our lines, let's now look at positioning them. Now, when you're new with infusion, there's something instinctive about setting an infusion up to run down the length of the hull. So you would put your resin feed line in at one end, you would put your vacuum line at the other, and you'd open up your lines, your resin would flow in, it'd all be going very well, and then it would just get slower and slower and slower until it came to a stop. Probably after about six hours, it would be here, and the entire part would be scrapped. But that can be avoided by following a simple rule on flow distance from your spiral. And this rule is that the resin shouldn't have to flow more than half a meter until it reaches either another spiral or your vacuum line. Now, in the case of flax, actually we can push this rule a little bit because it has a really open weave that the resin flows through very quickly. We can get all the way up to 750 millimeters and still have a sensible infusion time of around about 40 minutes. I know this because this is the technique that I used on my trial samples earlier, which is another great reason for doing tests like that. So that means that I can set this infusion up with a spiral just straight down the keel of the boat and then a vacuum running all the way around the perimeter at the gunnel. Equally, you could reverse this. You could run your resin feed in from the outside and your vacuum in the center. The resin infusion times will be very, very similar. I just find that it's a bit more practical to set it up this way, which is what we're going to do now. Before positioning the spiral, I am going to place it on top of some infusion flow mesh. Now, because of the unique properties of flax, we don't actually need to run mesh over the entire surface of the part like you would for carbon, Kevlar or glass. But having a small strip underneath the spiral does mean that the resin will get into the laminate and get started that bit better. But I will reiterate, if you're working with any other reinforcement, you would need to continue this over the entire surface of the molding. Apart from that though, everything else about the setup would be the same. The mesh spiral and MVL can all be secured down with small strips of duct tape. The resin inlets are positioned at regular intervals along the spiral. For these six millimeter feed lines, I would generally have one connector for every two kilograms of resin required as this will ensure that the hoses are not excessively restricting the resin inlet. And so for this project, I'll be using five inlets. The MVL can then be connected and sealed to the vacuum line. We have all of our lines in place. We can now close this off with a vacuum bag. And whilst I did put a seal all the way around the perimeter of the mold earlier on, this doesn't allow for the extra bag that's needed to follow all of the contours. For that, I'm going to need to add some pleats. With 
With the pleats added, the vacuum bag can be sealed. As with any infusion, ensuring a perfect seal is essential, which, although not difficult to achieve, does need to be done with the right approach. We have a few videos in our back catalogue that would be very useful for anyone starting out with infusion, including ones on microporous products like the MVL and on proper vacuum bagging technique. Links for these are in the description. With the bag sealed, the feed lines are connected, sealed, clamped, and then the vacuum can be drawn. As we're using the blue MVL, the initial drawdown will be done through one of the resin feed lines, as the MVL will restrict the airflow and would make it pull down very slowly. As the bag is pulling into the mold, I'm sliding it and positioning it to ensure that we don't get any tight spots and bridging, and also to ensure that all of the lines remain neatly in position. Once full vacuum is achieved, a drop test is performed to check the integrity of the seal. This can be done with either a mechanical or a digital gauge. Although the drop rate tolerance will vary depending on the materials used and the size of the component, for our purposes today, a drop rate of one millibar per minute or less is acceptable. The vacuum pump can then be swapped from the resin line onto the vacuum line and the vacuum can be held. As flax does hold moisture, I will leave the part under vacuum for five hours prior to the infusion to dry the fibre out. Without doing this, that moisture can be boiling out of the fibre, which can lead to air entrapment and voids in your part. After this time has passed, the resin feed lines can be secured into the buckets and the resin mixed. The obvious choice for resin when working with natural fibres is a bioresin. So we will be using the IB2 Infusion Bioresin, which is an epoxy-based system that doesn't compromise on performance. It simply replaces some of the petrochemical parts with plant-derived ones. So you get the best of both worlds. Excellent performance with improved environmental credentials. It is accurately weighed and thoroughly mixed with its hardener in the same way as you would with any other epoxy. This mix is then divided between the feed buckets, the lines are unclamped, and the infusion begins. You will notice that there appears to be a lot of bubbles at the front of the infusion. This is the result of any air that's mixed into the resin expanding when its pressure is reduced. This effect would certainly be lessened if I degas the resin prior to infusing, but in practice, the degassing does tend to effectively take place in the bag. So for all but the most critical applications, it's not normally required. These very distinct spikes of resin occurring along the flow front are caused by the improved flow provided by the cuts in the balsa core, which is the reason why this balsa is so well suited to resin infusion. During an infusion like this, you should monitor the levels of resin in the feed buckets. If one or more starts to run low, you can simply clamp this line, mix a new batch of resin, and then unclamp to resume. When infusing larger parts, it's much better to work from a series of smaller batches than to try and mix the entire quantity at the beginning. The reason for this is that due to the reduced ability for the resin to shed its heat in a larger volume, the amount of time you have before the resin starts to cure in the bucket or pot life is much less than the amount of time that the resin will flow for once it's spread out inside the molding. So in short, you will get more time to complete the infusion. Here you can see the MVL hose at work. In the areas where it's been reached by the resin, it will have become effectively sealed and so no resin will pass. But in the dry areas, the air can still escape and so it's maintaining vacuum. Once complete, the vacuum and resin feed lines are tightly clamped. Now that we're fully infused and clamped off, we're just going to leave this at room temperature to cure. We're now 48 hours later and the resin has reached its initial cure. Now I could have gone for a demold slightly sooner than this, but in leaving it a bit longer, the resin will cure that little bit further, which is going to reduce the risk of getting surface print through or potentially slight distortions. So all I need to do now is tear out these consumables and pop it from the mold. Although I do absolutely love this peel ply finish that we've got on the inside of the boat, I can't wait to pop this out and have a look at the molded face.
The component can then be rough trimmed. Generally, I use abrasive cutting wheels for trimming operations, but flax actually behaves more like wood than conventional composites. And so I've found that a fine wood blade and a multi-cutter does an excellent job. As I mentioned earlier, I've chosen not to use an in-mold gel coat, but instead coat the finished part with an epoxy resin. There are two reasons for this. Firstly, the mold that this part came from wasn't perfect, and so in coating it, we're actually going to improve the surface finish. Secondly, it allows me to use another bio-based resin, our XCR. While we don't market this as a bio-resin, with around 40% bio content, it's actually on a par with most dedicated bio-resins. And when used for coating parts like this, the XCR will provide an exceptional and UV-stable surface finish, making it the perfect choice for many coating applications, whether that's surfboards, boat decks, or in carbon fiber skinning. Now before applying this, I'm first going to key down the surface to provide a good bond. 400 grit abrasive is sufficient for the key and won't telegraph into the final coating. This could of course be done by hand, but a good DA sander will make light work of it. A quick wipe over with acetone ensures that the surface is clean and degreased. The XCR coating resin is mixed with its hardener and applied. To ensure an even coverage, I dab spots over the entire surface at frequent intervals, then spread it from here. Once fully covered, the coating can then be tipped with long strokes like you would a gloss paint. When using epoxy coatings for outdoor or marine applications, you must ensure that they are fully cured for several days before allowing them to get wet, as otherwise you will get a white film forming on the surface, which can be polished out but is nonetheless frustrating. All that's now left to do is the woodwork. I'm not going to go into great detail here as there is already lots of great information out there on canoe building, but I planed down the ash for the gunnels to dimension, routed a fillet onto the outwales, then drilled and counterbored the inwales to accept some stainless screws. These were then cut and fitted to the flax molding, then oiled on the hidden face and screwed together sandwiching the molding. The flax is then trimmed down and sanded in flush with the wood. Once the tips are shaped and sanded, the woodwork can be Danish oiled to its final finish. Here I'm adding some aramid braided wear strips to the front and back of the keel. Although not a natural fibre, these replaceable strips should give this canoe greater longevity. The area is first lightly keyed and then the braid is applied with XCR resin. You may know of the brand name Kevlar better than the technical name Aramid, but these Aramids are particularly resilient to impact and abrasion. We stock these braids both in natural yellow and in black. One of the most common uses for them is as a seam tape on kayaks, which join the upper and lower mouldings. Okay, we're now onto the finishing touches. Here I'm installing some off-the-shelf seats and yoke, and for the decks I've chosen to infuse them from flax. Using a simple mold folded from a piece of aluminium, I repeat the process used for the hull. So I apply a release agent, lay down the reinforcement with a balsa core, position the vacuum and feed lines, then pull a vacuum and infuse. Once cured, they're cut to size and secured in place. Throw on some decals and we have ourselves a finished flax canoe. The final canoe really does look amazing. Honestly, the camera doesn't do it justice. The wood grain-like appearance of the flax, perfectly complemented by the ash, really does make this look like something special. And I love the way that in bright sunlight, the slight translucency of the flax lets the light through and gives just a subtle hint as to its internal construction. The final canoe, fully fitted out, weighs in at just under 30 kilos, which for a canoe of this size makes it on a par with, or even a little lighter than a typical fiberglass one. Admittedly, it's not as light as the best carbon or Kevlar canoes, but it's definitely lighter on the planet, which we can all appreciate. In this video, we've barely scratched the surface of the resin infusion process, but if you would like to learn more, then watch this video where we cover the process in step-by-step -step detail. On the other hand, if it's the natural fiber reinforcement that you're more interested in, then our flax fiber and composites video takes a closer look at the pros, cons, and considerations of working with this material. 
from everyone here at Easy Composites. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.